Hello, everybody. I am Christy Koenig. I'm the EMS Medical Director for the County of San Diego, and it is my great pleasure to welcome our evidence-based medicine presentation today by Dr. Christian Sloan, and he will be speaking on flight medicine, among many other talents and uh, Accomplishments. He is the medical director for Mercy Air Services in San Diego and Imperial Counties. So I will pass it over to Dr. Sloan. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, is it okay if I take over the screen share here? Let's go ahead and get you guys going. You should be seeing a, a lovely place that I'd be happy to be at right now. Can you guys see that? All righty, so let's get the show on the road. So thank you for the introduction. Um, it's tough to, to follow uh, Brad's brief presentation because there's so many more questions I wanted to have answered, but uh, unfortunately you gotta listen to me now talk about helicopter EMS. A couple of disclosures, uh, potential conflicts of interest. I just like to be transparent. I am the medical director for Mercy Air San Diego, and I'm also the medical director for North County JPA. And um, I do have to admit uh, of this picture, there are some faces there. Many of you may recognize from working at your hospital, Sharp baby. I'm probably the least fit in that whole group right there. So uh, thanks for the opportunity here. Objectives, what we're gonna talk about. A brief history of air medicine uh, transport in the USA, followed by the, a little bit of a talk about the capabilities and justifications for use. Uh, and then what I see as some challenges that I think face the industry uh, coming up and that we deal with uh, to this day. You're gonna see a lot of pictures of uh, blue and white helicopters. It's, I don't have access and copyright to the red and white ones you might see flying around. It's certainly no bias on my part. Um, it's from the beginning of time, people have really wanted to fly. This is a picture of Da Vinci's aerial screw that he drew in the 1480s. Uh, it was designed to fly by having four people stand on the platform on the bottom and turn some things and that thing would get them into the air. Sikorsky took inspiration from this when he developed the helicopter much later. Here's Da Vinci's ornithopter, uh, again, a, a device where you'd lay on it and paddle and flap your wings and, and uh, achieve flight, didn't really go anywhere. Although it wasn't for lack of trying, there were people there uh, that tried to do it Otto Lilienthal and a uh, right glider crash in the bottom there. Probably had we had helicopter EMS at that time would have been uh, casualties that we would have transported. Anybody know this guy? This is a picture from a painting from 1792. It's Baron Dominique Jean Loret, the father of EMS. He was uh, Napoleon's chief surgeon. He commanded uh, 340 men, three divisions, each with 12 light and four heavy infantry carriages. But one of the things he noticed is he saw horses being used to transport uh, ra uh, artillery around rapidly. And he thought, well, maybe they could do the same thing with injured soldiers and came up with a thing called the ambulance volante, which was the precursor to uh, the very first uh, ambulances. They would transport uh, patients inside. Uh, they could put one or two, uh, depending on the, the configuration. And that was sort of the, the first uh, use of a, an ambulance in real life. Around the same time, uh, Charles Kite wrote this essay on the recovery of the apparently dead, uh, 1788, in which he wrote, the most important factor in success leading to the recovery of the apparently dead is the length of time that elapses uh, before the proper remedies can be applied. Despite this recognition over 230 years ago, we still in EMS and hospital medicine grapple with the concept of the right remedies at the right time. Fast forward to some more casualty stats here. Um, if you look at this graph, comparing evacuation time with mortality rate, uh, World War I, World War II, Korea and Vietnam, one of the things that you notice that uh, while maybe not directly correlated, there certainly is an association between the time it takes to get a soldier who's injured off the battlefield to definitive care. Uh, so the longer that takes, the longer, the higher your mortality rate. Um, so we did notice over time that that seemed to reduce. Uh, and that probably has something to do with the method of evacuation. What most of you probably think of as the first air medical transport uh, was probably MASH. We all my age group anyway, grew up with that show. There's probably people on the, on the presentation here who've never even heard of that. But the first uh, aeromedical evacuation was the Prussian siege of Paris in, um, back in the 1870s, where 160 soldiers, some injured, uh, were airlifted from Paris uh, in hot air observation rooms. So that, that stands as the first uh, evacuation. In 1903, the Wright brothers invented the airplane on December 17th for 12 seconds for the first flight. 
Um, second flight was 59 seconds and uh, bonus points if you guessed that Orville was the rudder that flew it. In 1910, two US Army medical officers designed an airplane to transport patients, uh, Grossman and Rhodes. And they uh, used their own money. They attempted to fly this thing in Florida. And on their first test flight, they flew a whopping 500 feet in distance at an altitude of 100 feet and they crashed. So the War Department said, no thanks. But in medicine, much like other things, if no mistake you've made, losing you are a different game you should play. In 1915, during the Serbian retreat from Albania, a French fighter, fighter pilot uh, evacuated an injured Serbian pilot. And this was the first documented fixed wing transport of a patient. And from then on, they designed some fighter planes to carry litters. Uh, the French, though, weren't too keen on this, and they said oh, there are not enough dead in France today without killing the wounded in airplanes. In 1918, uh, a captain for the uh, Army converted an, a JN-4 Jenny to carry a patient in a semi-recumbent litter in the rear cockpit, and the U.S. began using planes. Here's a picture from a GEM article that talks about the early history of air medicine. Single patient, they would configure them, they would be sort of strapped inside uh, underneath the, can uh, the canvas of the structure. And then a Cox Clement, which was another kind of airplane, was configured. And they, this is the first one to actually have a medical attendant, a physician in flight. In 1925, the formation of the US Army Air Corps happened. And uh, one of their tasks was to uh, rapidly evacuate and transport uh, wounded troops. Uh, they, these airplanes were called uh, Ships of Mercy. And uh, they became used mostly during the early part of the Banana Wars during the United States occupation of Nicaragua from 1912 to 1933. Um, the U.S. intervened in many Latin American countries uh, from 1898 to uh, 1934. Uh, the occupation of Nicaragua was around trying to protect and ensure that nobody else de developed a Nicaraguan uh, transcontinental canal. Ultimately, that site was sacrificed in favor of the Panama Canal, but um, that was the reason supposedly for being there. In 1926, they did fly 150 injured troops from Nicaragua to a French army hospital. Igor Sikorsky, a, a Russian Ukrainian immigrant, uh, invented the helicopter after he uh, came to the United States, September 14, 1939. And uh, during World War II, fixed wing aircraft transported one, almost a million and a half patients from frontline hospitals to tertiary medical centers with only 46 deaths in route. Now, because that's astounding statistics, uh, uh, there really wasn't much medical care. These were very stable patients that were being transported, but it, it did do amount to about 100,000 patients per month. Here's a picture of the inside. You can tell these are patients who are, are largely stable. There's not any medical intervention uh, going on during these relatively short transports. But it did highlight the need for the field of flight nursing. In 1943, uh, the Flight Nursing Corps was established with the first class in Bowman Field, Kentucky, um, when they, they essentially didn't have enough physicians to be able to do the job and uh, nursing stepped up and, and took on this task. Uh, they took a four week class in which they were taught flight physiology, uh, operating procedures around the aircraft loading, and then survival skills. During the Korean War, the helicopters that uh, were designed became sturdier. The rugged terrain of Korea was best suited for rotor wing transport. And though they only had 11 dedicated medevac helicopters, they transported over 20,000 patients. And if you are an aviation buff like myself, you can travel up to Chino Airport, uh, which is up in Riverside County, and you can see one of these Bell Model 47Ds that's sitting there in their place. Uh, for uh, So you can take a look at. You can see it's got a large uh, plexiglass canopy for the pilot. The engines are quite simple, um, and there's two litters, one on each side, that are just covered of plexiglass on the top uh, with uh, strapped in litter. There's no medical care that was done. This is all just transport. So they would be evacuated from the, the battlefield, stabilized, put on a litter, put in this, and then taken to a, a mobile army surgical, surgical hospital for which MASH was based upon that. Uh, during Vietnam War, uh, Operation Dust Off uh, was uh, using the uh, Bell uh, Huey helicopters, which were their mainstay. Um, they could lift up to nine patients uh, using a hoist above the dense jungle canopy. And they transported over 370,000 patients between 65 and 69, and nearly a million patients uh, for the duration of the war. This, a lot of the stuff is, is military, as you see, in, uh, you know, in a, a pre-hospital medicine, particularly in the austere environment, military seems to really does push uh, the envelope and development of some of these uh, technologies. The first civilian medical transports uh, came about in Australia 
there's the Australian Inland Mission Service was established uh, and they developed this aeromedical service, which later became the Royal Flying Doctor Service, uh, in which the physicians were tasked with flying out to patients that were in the outback, treating the patient and then fly them to a hospital if they needed that. Um, so this is the first uh, civilian company. Fast forward to the 1960s, a time of uh, change and a lot of uh, achievements. Uh, and when you had a whole bunch of surgeons and military people that had taken care of patients in Vietnam and came back to the United States and recognized that, hey man, the, uh, the medical care and rescue efforts in Vietnam are way more organized than what's happening in the United States. Uh, so there were more resources for injured soldiers than there were available to people who got injured on the highways. Um, and in fact, you know, Rosen wrote in his uh, paper here that civilian ambulances were no faster than taxis. And for a time, even funeral homes stepped in to, to perform ambulance services using a modified hearse equipped with uh, flashing lights. And they were, you know, to pick up and transport patients either to the hospital or the funeral home if they died on the way. Uh, but little care was rendered. The attendants would ride in the front. And this didn't last for long uh, before uh, things became, you know, thankfully better. Uh, after the Vietnam uh, War, they had these helicopters were designed for transporting patients, so the military loaned them out to uh, civilian agencies. Uh, in 1969, uh, there was uh, the first uh, mast flight was taken from Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, and then they got taken to other military bases to help uh, civilian agencies when they needed an air asset. And over the 10 years that the program was in use, they flew 16,000 patients. Civilian care then uh, sort of took over. In 1969, the Maryland State Police uh, developed a helicopter uh, program where they had pilot, police pilot and paramedic teams for the primary response. 72 Loma Linda began to use a helicopter solely for EMS, and then St. Anthony's also had one that had uh, acute care trained nurses flying. And then from then, things really took off. If you look at the initial slow growth uh, in early adoption in the 70s, there weren't very many, but by the end of 1980, there were 32 programs flying, 39 dedicated helicopters, by 1985, at 100 programs and helicopters, and then by the end of 86, over 150, and it, next, it nearly doubled over the next 10 years. And as of 2013, uh, while not on this graph, there were 800 dedicated medical helicopters operated by 225 services, flying about 400,000 hours a year. And here's a, a more recent slide that does show the number of helicopters in the country. One of the things that you do notice, though, is that the patients flown per helicopter uh, sort of has decreased over time. And, and I'll come back to this a little bit later as one of the challenges uh, for facing the industry. If you go on the Adams database, the Atlas and Database of, of Air Medical Services, you can see uh, a map of all air assets currently operating in the United States. Each uh, purple wing, each purple circle is a rotor wing base with a 10 minute flying circle. Each little ye uh, yellow box or white box is a fixed wing base. In 2018, there for the, which I have the latest data, there are 1,111 rotor wing uh, aircraft and 350 fixed wing aircraft operating in the US. There's different models that the industry operates under. Um, and I'll talk to these briefly here. There's, a, it, you know, obviously it was initially the military mass program and then it went public private. Um, right now, you primarily have three uh, different models in, in, the, in the world, really. You have hospital-based programs in which uh, a hospital buys a helicopter, uh, puts their logo on the side and, uh, and operates it. Sometimes they'll uh, use uh, private company pilots, uh, that, but well, they'll staff it with their own people from their own hospital. It's viewed as in many ways a loss leader, um, meaning that the program costs a lot of money, but the hospital uses it to go and uh, transport patients that tend to be very profitable for the hospitals back to their hospital uh, to, to run the, the program that way. Um, then you've got the industry uh, community-based uh, services, uh, which is what we operate here in San Diego, where a private company takes uh, and runs the, the, the helicopter, provides the flight crews, essentially takes all the risk, uh, and but also uh, makes all the money uh, for a community. And then you've got, in other parts of the world, you have the government-based uh, programs where the government owns and runs everything. Why would you, you know, why do we have aeromedical transport? This is one of the things that uh, people are always wondering, why do we need it? Is it the great photo ops? Here's a picture, blast from the past of San Diego's old life flight days. It's not that, but it's, you know, it's speed. In 2005, 
uh, Diaz et al. Uh, analyzed over 9,000 ground and air 911 dispatch transports. And when they looked at those, Air Medical had a faster arrival to hospital when simultaneously dispatched with ground for distances over 10 miles. Um, when they, uh, they had an early arrival when they were dispatched after the ground transports when the distance from the scene was greater than 45 miles. But really, so the, the sweet spot for helicopter EMS tends to be around 15 to 100 miles. Much longer than that, uh, you need to go to fixed wing transports. And that's not something that's typically used for scene response. It's more inner facilities. Some of the helicopter vital data, what we're operating here in San Diego County is the bottom, the EC-135 Eurocopter uh, with a crew speed of 158 miles an hour, can transport 3,200 pounds. That includes crew, gear, fuel, all that, with a range of about 500 miles, although nobody's flying 500 miles here. Um, here's a bad cervical spine x-ray. So maybe if that was your cervical spine and you were down at the bottom of that ravine there, and the only road out was that big bumpy road right there. You may want to contact a different asset. So distances over difficult terrain would be another time where uh, helicopter EMS uh, has a role. They're used at special events. Here's a picture of a NASCAR race where you have large groups of people uh, in an activity where there's a high uh, probability of uh, significant medical injuries, where it may be difficult to get in and out of that venue, even though it may not be far from a hospital if traffic is a problem, a helicopter has a special role there. Here's a picture uh, being staged at the Miramar Air Show, again, because it could take a while for a ground-based ambulance to get out of there uh, in the event of, of an accident. Pediatrics specialty care here in San Diego, we fly the children's CHET team uh, for specialized uh, transfers from inner hospital. Neonatal transports, the helicopters can be configured to carry uh, neonatal uh, incubators. In some parts of the country, not so much here, but in other parts, it's important to augment uh, ALS level of care to areas where it doesn't exist. So where you have perhaps only uh, EMT uh, first responders. So that's a special role that the helicopter can be used for. Uh, you can respond with multiple ALS resources to distant scenes. Here's an old picture. You guys remember the back in the days of critical air uh, there or in MCIs in which you have uh, a large number of casualties or potentially large number of casualties that could easily overwhelm uh, the nearest hospital. And so the concept of leapfrogging where maybe you load many onto ground ambulances to the nearest hospital and use helicopters to spread those to further hospitals away from the, the incident so as to allow for better medical care for the larger number of patients. Old picture. During disaster response, we used uh, helicopters quite a bit during our disaster response to, uh, for Hurricane Katrina, in which uh, we would transport some of the more critical patients larger distances to areas that weren't affected by the hurricane. And then interfacility critical care transports, uh, the capabilities that the uh, helicopter brings, the ability to do things like impella and, and intra aortic balloon pumps and things like that to transport those patients with the least amount of time outside of the hospital. It's truly a mobile, mobile ICU. These are some of the skills and procedures that the air crews bring to the patients, uh, tube thoracostomies, innovations using RSI, ventilator management, trikes, uh, balloon pump and impella device management, central line management, advanced meds. Our formulary is quite extensive, uh, more than uh, what our ground-based providers are carrying. And then some agencies are carrying blood and some are carrying TXA. Might want to have a tube thoracostomy for that. Here's some advanced airway management. I've got a lot of pictures of Jim Dunford here back in the days when he was a, a flight physician. Advanced airway management in the dirt. Nothing too surprising. This is the kind of patient that we might get. COVID was a particular challenge uh, for health systems, as we all know. I'm not going to get <laughs> bore you guys with that, but one of the things that helicopter really stepped up for, and even the fixed wing assets, was the ability to transport these patients who had um, an infectious disease with very complex ventilator settings uh, safely for, uh, over large distances. Uh, this was used quite a bit, um, particularly in Imperial County, to help out Imperial County to um, send patients to other hospitals that did have the capacity that uh, the Imperial County simply did not because of the, the pandemic. 
Uh, another thing is blood. We had a great talk last month uh, looking at the, the use of pre-hospital blood products. Not going to go too far into that, um, but there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the pre-hospital use of blood in the right patient uh, makes a difference. Uh, during a secondary analysis of PAMPER, they showed that uh, patients receiving both PRVCs and plasma had the highest adjusted survival rates, uh, but any blood product given pre-hospital was uh, superior to crystalloid alone. And so one of the things that we've started doing within the last year is carrying blood. Our current indications, we carry PRBCs and plasma. Um, the one on the top is more for interfacilities, so not really applicable to the majority of work that we do. But uh, signs of shock in the setting of acute hemorrhage with evidence of hypoperfusion, um, hypotension, and tachycardia. For plasma, similar um, uh, indications there as well. And uh, what we do is we carry type A plasma and type O positive packed red cells. We don't have the ability to get O negative because it's such a, a scarce resource. Uh, and so if we do end up uh, transporting a patient who is female of childbearing age and we do give a uh, unit of O positive, we do make sure to let the receiving facility know because they can give Rogam uh, and address that. Uh, we carry two units of packed cells and one unit of plasma. Um, plasma was, a, was the latest addition. We didn't start giving that until recently just because of availability. Um, and it's stored at the bases in uh, continuously monitored temperature uh, refrigerators uh, with a continuous log that keeps track of it. And then when we transport, we use this Veracor cool cube, which can keep uh, products at uh, one to six degrees C for 39 hours. Um, and so if we don't use it on a particular flight, we can bring that back and, and put it back in the refrigerator, it can still be reused. And then things when uh, the products get towards the end of their uh, useful life, we return them to the blood bank so that they can be used in a high use uh, center such as hospital. In 2021, we had 14 base locations carrying blood. We gave out 92 blood products pre-hospital, 125 units of packed red cells, 30 units of plasma with a, about a 7.3% rate of utilization for our flights. That's for Mercy Air uh, company-wide. Uh, in 2022, it was so far this year, 59 units of packed cells, 28 units of plasma, the majority being given for traumatic mechanisms, blunt trauma being the predominant, uh, much like much of the trauma patients in, in our area. And uh, different mechanisms of MVC there, you see it's all spread between pretty much all types of uh, uh, MVC types. So this is all, I mean, from what I've showed you there, you can see the things that we can do and and you know, why we might do it, but a lot of you might be saying, you know, well, where's the beef? There are, it is not a, um, a stretch to say that there are people that are skeptics uh, with respect to uh, HEMS. And so I tried to, wanted to try and talk to you guys a little bit about what some of the evidence might show. So when one decides the method of transport they're gonna use, there are several considerations you wanna take a look at, and I've listed five there. Um, that would be important to factor in, and not the least of which the bottom one, which is cost. These things are not cheap. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but these are all things that we have to consider. There's really not great evidence out there either way uh, when it comes to the use of uh, HEMS. In the most general sense, medical helicopters, they provide significant benefits by manipulating time. That's probably the, the thing where you can find the most evidence to support it. Time to reach definitive care or to receive critical interventions. Um, that's sort of the one view. There's an evolving model and another look at it where you know, perhaps there, there is the speed aspect, but also you can deliver you know, a, a, an ED or ICU level of care to a patient in the pre-hospital arena. And does that make an impact? And does that potentially, um, does that make a benefit? So there's four major categories of uh, medical problems in which there's a literature base to address. Um, start with trauma. Most of these are large retrospective registry studies. So the study quality is not fantastic. Uh, Baxton Moody in 83, one of the first studies looked at it and noted a 52% reduction in predicted mortality if a patient was transported by air versus the ground. Um, note that the time did the time to transport was longer if they did go by air versus the ground. Uh, University of Rochester study in 2011 had 75,000 patients. Again, another registry study showed that air patients had a higher ICU admission rate, shorter transport times, 
shorter pre-hospital times, and an increased rate of survival if the ISS was greater than 15. No difference if it was less than that. University of Maryland in 2012 had a study of 223,000 patients where a helicopter was associated with a 16% increased rate of survival, which gave you a number needed to transport of about 65 patients in order to save a life. Bolger had a, a negative trial in which uh, he showed there was no difference in the adjusted clinical outcome according to the mode of transport. So uh, it was a negative study. However, air medical transports more often were transporting severely injured patients with more advanced life support procedures and longer pre-hospital time. But it was a negative study shown. It didn't really make a difference. One of the more interesting uh, studies that I came across recently uh, when I did my review of this was a study by Chen where they looked at, is there any patients that may benefit from helicopter transport despite being able to go faster by ground? And this, is, this was interesting to show. They found that these three factors here sort of seem to have an, a higher adjusted odd ratio for survival. Respirate, respiratory rate less than 10 or greater than 29, a GCS less than or equal to eight, or if they had a hemothorax or pneumothorax uh, that was found after you know, when they got to the hospital. So those things predicted uh, that HEMS was gonna have a higher survival rate uh, than ground, even though it might uh, have been taking longer. So that, that, that's, I think, going in the right direction because I think this is the biggest challenge for us. You know, you guys are familiar with the uh, trauma triage algorithm. It's got a whole bunch of things listed there. And that, that's very, if you just say, well, plug it into step one or step two and make those ones major traumas, the fly by helicopter for a certain distance, that probably is over transporting a lot of patients. Um, NAEMSP came out with a position paper that talks about, you know, how do you go about selecting which patients you're going to be flying by helicopter, lots of considerations there. Rotterdam uh, Helicopter Service has come up with a different uh, sort of group of rules that they use. Um, and even London Hams has got a very simple uh, group of rules that they'll use uh, to decide when they're gonna launch the helicopter. Some of these places have, they staff their helicopters differently. Uh, some places auto launch helicopters, which is not something that we do here in San Diego, uh, where they'll dispatch a helicopter from the very beginning of receiving a call. But they're all trying to find out what is that group of patients that benefits the most. We've got a protocol here, uh, policy number A475, uh, that was revised in 2016 that attempts to do this a little bit. But again, it, it's very broad. It includes a lot of patients. Um, and, uh, and it does have a, a time component uh, for consideration. When you look at cardiovascular disease, um, studies initially suggested that there were worst outcomes with helicopter transport, and they postulated possibly due to elevated catecholamines during that air transport. Subsequent studies showed that you can safely do it. Um, and, and a lot of outcomes-based studies really focused on the reduction of the door to balloon times. Cardiac arrest studies show that there's really no benefit uh, for cardiac arrest uh, for um, a helicopter. You really can't do CPR well in a helicopter uh, unless you have an automatic uh, CPR device. You can prolong the out-of-hospital time by using a helicopter. There are some cases of non-cardiac arrest cases, meaning that they had a primary other reason that may benefit. Um, and then, you know, there's patients that uh, have ROSC and BLS-only areas that may benefit from being transported. This you know, may all change uh, with some of the work that our group is doing on the, LUC, on the ECMO uh, centers and, and systems of care there. That may, if they determine a subset of patients that may benefit uh, from transport by the helicopter, that may be something that down the road may be done, um, certainly if, with the proliferation of mechanical CPR devices. But for now, there's really not, not a lot of evidence to suggest we should be transporting cardiac arrest patients, which is why we don't. Uh, neuro neurologic studies, there's very few studies looking at this. Um, one study looked at uh, patients being transported after receiving lytics, no problem. Uh, the time component critical, you know, they are time component critical with a four and a half TPA window and up to 24 hours from some uh, neurovascular intervention. So if you can do an interfacility transfer and, and cut down the amount of time they're at a hospital, there's, there's possibly some benefit there. Although one large review by Olson did really call into question the benefit of using a helicopter. Uh, they he had a study of 122 patients who'd already received uh, lytics and then got transferred. And he showed that there was no, um, no benefit to using a helicopter. One of the things that our stroke uh, colleagues at uh, UCSD have devised is a thing called the Brain Emergency Management Initiative, the BEMI Initiative. 
And that's something that uh, they use, both providers here, uh, Reach and Mercier, participate in this in which we really try to cut down the amount of time taken to transfer a patient from one hospital to another if they're going for uh, stroke intervention so that we will run these much like a scene call where the helicopters kept turning on the pad. We'll go down to a very brief uh, turnover from the hospital staff and uh, transfer the patient as quick as possible in order to cut down that time outside the hospital and time to further intervention because as we all know, brain uh, time, is, time is brain. When it comes to obstetrics, uh, there are lots of studies that support the safety of transporting uh, patients uh, in labor, particularly when the, you know, the patient has no uh, higher level services at the referring facility. So the risks are comparable to non-transport of these patients. So in general, we do transport uh, high risk obstetrics uh, to other hospitals if they really need to go, uh, because obviously they will not have, um, a, they'll have the possibility of a, of a negative outcome at the hospital they're at, so we'll try and get them to a place where they can do better. So future directions, my, my sum of it is, is that I think tra trauma has a decent body of literature to support the general use. And I think the thing that, that not only the industry, but systems need to do is try and hone in on which ones are the ones that we should be flying, because uh, we don't want to be uh, flying patients that don't need it. There's some evidence to suggest that, that they can be used in cardiac and neurological issues. The question is which ones uh, have the most benefit and other conditions, just not well studied. ASAP tried to come up with an algorithm for agencies or systems to use when they try to decide whether or not to use uh, HEMS and based mostly on time and uh, distance. I'd like to add in another arrow there that really addresses that issue of does the patient need a level of care unavailable by ground EMS? And if they do, then you should consider HEMS begin because of the expanded scope that the helicopter can bring to the patient's bedside. Uh, for inner facilities, they've got another algorithm. Again, really a lot of it's looking at uh, time to um, intervention and uh, does the helicopter provide a benefit there? And if it doesn't, really go by ground. Uh, and this last study I want to mention uh, by Daniel uh, Butler et al. in Emergency Medicine Journal in 2010, I really, I think summed it up really well. Is it the H or the, or the EMS and HEMS that has an impact on trauma patient mortality? They looked, um, this study was full of a bunch of limitations, but they, I like this quote, the role and structure of HEMS in a modern trauma service is a debate that is likely to continue. Pre-hospital care design should be specific to critical incident frequency, geographical arrangements of hospital facilities, and travel times within each trauma network. It's important also to consider the benefits and capabilities of the emergency medical team separately from the transport method being considered. An effective helicopter EMS will ultimately depend on effective operating procedures and tasking protocols, clinical governance, and auditing of the helicopter EMS activity. Uh, that last part might be um, key if you're going to make uh, tweaks to your system. Without that, I, I don't know how you make it better. Some of the challenges, not talking about zombie apocalypses or Gary Vilks, youthful appearance in this picture of blast from the past, or your psychiatric patients. No, we're talking about big one here, which I think everyone thinks about, which is the cost factor, uh, taking patients for a ride. It seems like Every year or two, an article like this will come out in a major a news publication. I think we had one a couple of months ago uh, that came out um, that really puts a black eye on the industry, in my opinion. What does it take to provide EMS services? There's a lot of stuff that goes into running one of these uh, air EMS services. Uh, none of it's cheap, and it has to be staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, crews, which consist of nurse, paramedics, and a pilot, have to be ready to deploy within minutes. You've got to have bases. There's just, there's just a lot of stuff that goes into it. Um, and if you look at the who we transport, um, this is slightly old data from 2017, but the most recent I could get for you, uh, shows that private insurance carriers, which quite honestly pay the best, are only about a quarter of the patients transported with the rest largely being government uh, insurers. And over the years, there's been a big shift in, in who's being flown. Um, there's been a market reduction in the number of privately insured patients with commensurate increases in government funded uh, patients. We say, well, that's, at least you're getting paid something. The problem is, is that in general, three patients out of every 10 were paying for the other seven patients to be flown. The average cost for a helicopter transport for the average base is about $11,000. 
Um, most government payers pay far below that, Medicare paying the best with just over half. So um, those costs have to be shifted to the 30% who had private insurance um, in order to pay that balance. And here you can sort of see again that about 27% of patients pay for about three quarters of reimbursement. The, if you look at population centers across the US, there's a, a heat map showing just population centers. And then you compare that with trauma centers. If you look at the trauma centers, all tend to be in the areas where there's large population centers. Makes sense. Problem is there's a lot of patients who aren't close to trauma centers. If you look at uh, across the country, there are almost 50 million Americans who don't have access to a level of one or two trauma centers within an hour. Uh, helicopters help bridge that gap. It ends up being about 30% of the population. Uh, the No Surprises Act is something that was just passed and being implemented now. Um, you know, it's come about the average out of pocket for a patient who is insured or, or unfunded is less than $300. It's about $280. Um, the, I think it remains to be seen how this uh, bill will affect the industry. Um, I think what you will see is some consolidation of companies um, because there's a lot of small uh, mom and pop shops that still run uh, helicopter ambulances that won't be able to deal with the billing delays that uh, the change in the way that this is being, um, that, they're, that they're being billed uh, through insurance companies who now will, are starting to deny claims out of just, just first off, get a claim, they'll deny it. And then the company has to go back and try and get reimbursement for it. So that's gonna drive some of them out of business. Um, so you'll see some consolidation of companies, you'll see some consolidation of bases that uh, are no longer profitable. Uh, it may mean that um, some communities may not have as easy access or a short term of access to uh, helicopters, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, there's an article from 2019 that uh, 35 bases closed down in 2019. Some of that might be good because there's probably some redundant uh, assets out there, but how that if the long-term effects we'll see. Another challenge that the industry has faced is safety. Um, there was a bad, there was bad year in 2008 in which there were uh, way too many uh, helicopter accidents. One is too many, but there was a big spike in number of helicopter EMS accidents. Um, and you know, at, right now at the time, uh, 1980, a crew member had a one in 50 chance of being in a fatal accident. That number is a lot better today. Um, as a result of some of the work that was done by the NTSB during the report, the special investigation report, they came out with several recommendations as a result of the crashes that they made to the industry in order to make things safer. And a lot of those are listed here. Um, the addition of night vision goggles for use during nighttime flights, we do that in San Diego. Uh, having IFR capable uh, aircraft and pilots, meaning that they can fly by instruments alone uh, if the weather gets bad. Believe it or not, there are places in the country that have only VFR pilots, meaning that they can only fly when the weather is good. If the weather deteriorates, they're no longer certified to fly in those conditions. Uh, dual engine aircraft, which we have here in San Diego, the EC-135 has two engines instead of one, which offers that nice redundancy. And then uh, fire resistant fuel tanks, again, which these aircraft have. And lastly, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure of, of, of Reach's policies, but I'm sure it's similar. Uh, our company policy is that it takes three crew, three crew members to go and only takes one person that's not comfortable with a flight to say no, and then we will cancel that flight. Uh, another challenge that I think that the industry faces is training and uh, maintaining the, crew, the, the competence of the crews um, in the face of a younger, less experienced pool of flight crews. Um, nowadays, uh, you only have to have three years of critical care experience in either the ED or the ICU in order to fly as a nurse uh, or fly as a paramedic. Um, so it's tough to maintain that currency and keep them uh, experienced and trained in order to do the procedures that we do. The expanded scope requires uh, a lot of additional training. Uh, our company does uh, cadaver labs annually for the flight crews. Uh, we do SimMan uh, tube thoracostomies and crike labs uh, annually in addition to the cadaver labs in order to maintain proficiency. Uh, we do RSI labs, and then we do high, fide high fidelity patient simulation encounters uh, in which we use SimMan and have the crews uh, perform in those, and those are done every six months. So here's some, um, some shots from our training that we'll do, both uh, in the helicopters and sometimes uh, on the bases, and then cadaver lab there at the bottom. So that's a, a big challenge 
is maintaining uh, the crew's uh, proficiency. The slide I showed you earlier about the gradually decreasing number of uh, flights or patients per helicopter um, is the challenge. You know, uh, every time you add a helicopter, you do lit out the number of patients that can be transported by any particular crew. Um, this has led us to the development of some uh, training techniques and a checklists that we'll use in order to help uh, improve proficiency and involve our ground teams uh, when we will uh, take over patients from our ground crews. Uh, we have an RSI checklist and in order to really make sure that we maximize that preparation and planning before we'll do a procedure. Uh, the ground crews uh, are now familiar with this and will help participate in that with us uh, to improve our outcomes. Some of the research that we've done uh, that has come out of the, the HEMS world, if you look at, uh, for a while we were noticing, you know, we just looked at our rest data and episodes of hypotension, and you see that the episodes of hypotension closely mirrored episodes of arrest, meaning that patients that got hypotensive tended to arrest. Around uh, quarter eight there, where we had the slide, we introduced uh, push dose pressors into our protocols and started using um, vasopressin for traumatic uh, hypotension and uh, neosinephrine for uh, medical hypotension. And we still had the same number of hypotensive events, but it really decreased our arrest events. And that was uh, one of the things that led us to continue to endorse the use of this in the field. Uh, and then aero innovation stationary versus transport is another study we did uh, looking at um, 3,254 patients. What we found is that doing the innovation while you're stationary, either on the ground or in the back of an ambulance, um, had uh, a less desaturation events than if you did it during transport. First, sec first pass success was the same, stationary versus during transport, but our desaturation events, which is particularly important in patients who are potentially head injured, uh, was uh, statistically significantly lower. So this again led us to company-wide, our, our push is to, if we know we need to innovate a patient, we'll do that on the ground before we get into the helicopter and transport because we have that uh, less uh, risk of desaturation. So that, that covers the bulk of what I wanted to, to cover. I have some other slides that I could do, but I think you guys have probably had enough, especially since you haven't had a break yet. Uh, but at this time I could make myself available for questions if anybody had any.